So this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about a research project I conducted last year as an obstetric anesthesia fellow at Northwestern University, which resulted in this publication um, in the International Journal of Obstetric Anesthesia entitled Anesthetic Management of Parturients with Arnold Carey Malformation Type 1, a Multicenter Retrospective Study. This is a collaborative work of people from multiple institutions, including Mount Sinai Healthcare System in New York, um, Northwestern University, Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, Duke, and The Ohio State. So parturients or pregnant women with ACM type 1 are usually not diagnosed until adulthood and may be asymptomatic or may exhibit symptoms such as headache, ataxia, and sensory motor impairments of the extremities. So why do we care about this? The anesthetic and obstetric management of parturients with ACM1 remains controversial. It is intuitive that CSF pressure will increase um, with contractions during the first stage of labor, which is again the onset of regular contractions up till 10 centimeters dilated, as well as during the second or pushing stage of labor in which uh, moms have the Valsalva. Oftentimes, obstetricians have deferred to the expert opinion of neurosurgeons and neurologists regarding the safest mode of delivery for their patients. This may be especially prudent when a patient may have active symptoms of increased ICP, like headache, nausea, vomiting, hypertension, vision changes, and mental status changes. So the anesthetic plan for these patients is not straightforward. In the healthy pregnant population, neuraxial analgesia and anesthesia are preferred for a few reasons. Labor epidurals provide the optimal level of pain control, much more than intravenous medications such as fentanyl or remifentanil, nitrous oxide, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or TENS, or breathing techniques. In the case of cesarean deliveries, spinals and epidurals are preferred because they avoid instrumentation of the maternal airway, which often can be swollen, friable, and not as easy to successfully intubate on first attempt. Neuraxial anesthesia prevents exposing the fetus to a general anesthetic, which if they are exposed to, often makes the newborn depressed and in need of extra stimulation and breathing support from a pediatric team. There is also the emotional benefit of mom being awake for the delivery of her baby. While there are several advantages of using neuraxial techniques in the parturient population, anesthesiologists have to determine if those techniques are indeed safe for this patient population. The risk of an unintentional dural puncture with a two-way epidural needle, or even an uncomplicated spinal anesthetic, can put select patients at risk for a CSF pressure gradient between the brain and spinal cord. And this, of course, can lead to the feared brain herniation. Meanwhile, general anesthesia with laryngoscopy and, in, and intubation can also transiently increase your ICP or create such an increased CSF gradient. Since no prospective randomized trial can likely be conducted for practical reasons, the mainstay of the literature regarding the anesthetic management for parturients with ACM1 are case reports and smaller case series, reviews of the literature, and algorithms. The purpose of this study was to conduct a larger review of the anesthetic management and related complications of parturients with ACM1 who delivered either vaginally or by cesarean at four academic medical centers in the US. So we conducted an IRB-approved multi-center retrospective cohort study to evaluate, again, the anesthetic practices for these patients. Data were obtained using ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes from the electronic databases of these medical centers. If information was, mi was missing, then a manual chart review was conducted. The study period ranged from January 2007 to June 2017 at three of the institutions, and from March of 2004 to June of 2017 at one institution. And these dates were based on the implementation of electronic medical records at these hospitals. Inclusion criteria was pretty simple, basically any pregnant patient who had ACM1 diagnosis, and there were no exclusion criteria. Data that was collected included maternal demographics, ACM symptoms, time of diagnosis, whether it was before or after they had delivered, any surgical intervention prior to delivery, whether it was um, a decompression or if they had placement of a shunt, the anesthetic management and um, anesthetic complications during hospitalization, as well as the obstetric management and route of delivery. Data were analyzed by delivery numbers rather than by patients, thus each delivery was regarded and analyzed as a separate entity. And the primary outcome was anesthetic complications during hospitalization for their delivery, and descriptive statistics were, were performed. 
So for the results, we had 185 deliveries and 148 patients. The average BMI was 33.2 with a range from 20.3 to 62.7. The average age of the parturients was 30 with a range of 27 to 33. The racial or ethnic background, uh, majority, 66 of the percent of the deliveries had moms who were white, non-Hispanic. The next most common was black, non-Hispanic, followed by other, other Hispanic, white, Hispanic, etc., going down the list. Um, regarding their parity, or the number of babies they had had, um, 72 of the deliveries had moms who were, it was their first time having a baby, so they were nulliparous. 67 deliveries were moms who had one prior delivery, and 46 of the deliveries, moms had two or more in the past. The average gestational age in weeks and days was 38 weeks and six days, with a range from 37 and three to 39 and five. So no one technically actually made it to the term of 40 weeks. Um, out of the 185 deliveries, 147 had a diagnosis of, a, of ACM prior to delivery. Uh, neurosurgical intervention before was conducted in 53 of the, del of 53 of the deliveries, or 36%, and patients had pre-existing symptoms, typically mild, including headache, abnormal sensation, or some motor involvement of their extremities, and this was present in 89 of the deliveries. So this table shows the anesthetic and obstetric practice patterns among the four institutions. Along the first line, you can see with institutions A, B, C, and D, um, a and C constituted two-thirds of our patient um, data, while B and C uh, conduct, uh, combined was about another third. So paying more attention just to the mode of delivery, um, you can see that there was a division between vaginal spontaneous and vaginal operative. Operative is meaning if they had a vacuum-assisted delivery or a forceps-assisted delivery, and really only one institution actually used this technique on any of their deliveries. Um, but the overall breakdown was that vaginal deliveries occurred in 80 of the cases, 43%, and cesarean occurred in 105, which is 57%. The breakdown of the analgesic or anesthetic technique with more concentration of your neuraxia versus your general is that there seemed to be an overall predilection of neuraxial um, in two of the hospitals with um, hospital B showing you actually a pretty equal distribution between general anesthetics and neuraxial techniques. Here is the list of the indications for cesarean delivery with these patients. Uh, the number one reason was because they were having a repeat C-section. So it was an indication just that they weren't going to allow these patients a trial labor after a cesarean or TOLAC. Um, the second indication was neurosurgical or neurological team's recommendation followed by failure to progress was that they didn't uh, fully dilate or if baby did not descend into the pelvis properly. Um, then it was non reassuring fetal heart rate, malpresentation like breach or transverse lie. There were a number of cases that were not documented the reason for cesarean, followed by large baby, abnormal placentation like a previa, and then one had a patient request. And the anesthetic techniques used for each type of delivery is shown here. Um, of note, neuraxial procedures were performed for 135 out of the 185 deliveries, that's 73%. There were 67 epidural catheters, 39 single-shot spinals, and 29 combined spinal epidurals, or CSEs. Three of these epidural catheters had to be converted to a general anesthetic for cesarean delivery, making the total number of general anesthetics 34, or 18%. A sub-analysis was done on patients with ACM1 and syringomyelia. The mode of delivery and type of anesthetic of each of these 17 deliveries is shown here. So out of the 17, nine of them had a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery, seven had an elective cesarean, and one had an intrapartum cesarean, which is basically an indication they were laboring but then had to go for a section. Um, eight of the 17 had an epidural, two of them, oh sorry, three had a combined spinal epidural, two a spinal and four had a general anesthetic. So complications, which was the primary outcome of the study. There were no reported catastrophic neurological complications for these patients. post puncture headache did occur in three out of the 135 who received neuraxial, te uh, neuraxial techniques. One of these patients who had a PDPH was reported to have a single shot spinal. Two of the patients had syringomyelia, which actually made the incidence of PDPH in this subgroup of 17 total deliveries 
almost 12%. And of this subgroup of the two with syringomyelia, one had an unintentional dural puncture with like an 18 or 17 gauge TUI, and one had a presumably otherwise not noted uncomplicated uh, epidural. Regarding the uh, GA group, there was one patient who experienced a general, uh, uh, sorry, an aspiration pneumonia. Otherwise, there were no other documented complications. So, to furthermore, with the results, there were in there were cases of missing information. Um, eight uh, charts lacked post-operative notes, so we're not sure if any any specific type of symptoms may have actually developed. Fifteen had no mention of pre-existing neurological symptoms. Eighteen had no BMI, and two there was no mention of anesthetic techniques. So, our numbers that our denominator were adjusted appropriately regarding this. So in this multi-institutional large cohort study, we evaluated again the data on the anesthetic management and complications of these patients. Despite the high utilization rate of neuroaxial procedures, there were no reported cases of worsening neurological symptoms. The instance of unintentional dural puncture was similar to rates reported for parturients without ACM, but the relative risk of PDPH may be greater in patients with syringomyelia. However, the low number of patients with documented syringomyelia and high variability in our estimates preclude our concluding this with high confidence. The anesthetic management complications were analyzed by number of deliveries, not by number of patients, due to the possible changes in neurological status of women with multiple deliveries. Of note, 20% of the patients did not know that they had ACM1 prior to, their, prior to their delivery, which is important because it demonstrates how mild herniation can be asymptomatic and often is an incidental finding. It is unknown if their postpartum diagnoses were made because patients became symptomatic or if it was a finding from a different workup. We did observe institutional practice differences regarding anesthetic techniques and mode of delivery. In one hospital system, most patients with ACM1 were encouraged to have a neurosurgical consultation during their pregnancy. Per the consultant's recommendation, most of these women had a cesarean, deliver, a cesarean delivery under general anesthesia. In the other three institutions, there was less of a trend uh, regarding the mode of delivery. Two of the institutions had a pre-election for neuroaxial anesthetics, either whether the patient was having a vaginal delivery or cesarean. So otherwise, algorithms have been created to assist in the decision process um, for these patients. In 2013, Lefford and Schwamm produced a decision tree summarizing the critical elements for assessing the risk of neurological deterioration from neuroaxial anesthesia in patients with uh, intracranial space occupying lesions. So if you're looking at this chart itself, in the top corner just asks if you have a known intracranial pathology, yes. Furthermore, if you're looking at, um, if they don't have any new symptoms, if they don't have a space occupying lesion, if there's no evidence of hydrocephalus and no increased ICP, then you can go ahead with your neuroaxial technique. If any of these have some question, then they pretty much recommend that you then go towards the right side of the chart and go for either an absolute uh, indication to not proceed with the neuroaxial, like if they are having significant mass effects, um, or if there's some kind of subtle mass effect or some obstruction of CSF flow, then you should be consulting with the neurosurgeon or neurologist um, as part of your decision making. Subsequently, in 2017, uh, the Galley Obstetric Guide to Arnold Carey Malformation Type 1 or GOGAC 1 was published to assist in deciding the anesthetic technique specifically for patients with varying severity of ACM1. In this, it's a much simpler algorithm. Essentially, it's asking, does the patient have ACM1 and is symptomatic? And if you say yes, that's one point. If there's presence of tonsillar herniation greater than 10 millimeters, that's another point. And if they have presence of syringomyelia, that's a third point. So if there's one point, you have to have a multidisciplinary meeting between anesthesia and obstetrics. If there's two points, you have to involve neurosurgery. And if there's three points, neurosurgery must be involved and there's going to be a planned cesarean delivery. So there have been prior publications regarding management of patients with this neurological complication. The case series uh, presented by Chantigian and others in 2002 did include evaluation of both neuroaxial and general anesthetics. Uh, they presented a total of 12 patients, nine who received neuroaxial and three who underwent GA. Like in our cohort, there was no worsening of neurological ACM-related symptoms in any of the patients, but one patient did develop a post puncture headache after an unintentional dural puncture. Uh, and this was ameliorated with an epidural blood patch. Of the nine neuroaxial techniques, six were epidurals, one was a spinal catheter, 
and two were single shot spinals. In 2013, Choi and Tiagaraj published a review of the literature on neuraxial anesthesia techniques for parturients with ACM1, as well as a case report of a patient who received a CSE technique for labor analgesia without any complications. This review included 22 patients who received neuraxial who did not have worsening ACM symptoms, but it did not include patients who received general anesthesia. So for our study impact, our study represents the largest evaluation of anesthetic management of obstetric patients with ACM1 to our knowledge to date. It further supports that neuraxial techniques are a viable anesthetic option. The major limitation of our study is that it was retrospective, and the number of electronic medical records were, had some incomplete data. And this important information could have influenced the anesthesiologist or obstetrician's choice for anesthesia technique or mode of delivery. So in conclusion, anesthetic complications occurred infrequently in patients with ACM1 regardless of the anesthetic management. And a tailored approach to individual patients with multidisciplinary team discussions, use of algorithms, et cetera, are all up to uh, four favorable outcomes in this patient population. Thank you.